U.S. Supreme Court's draft opinion on Roe v. Wade is playing out politically in Canada too, prompting questions to the government about inconsistent access to abortion services. This government has been in power for seven years and has done nothing to expand access to abortion services. We will never back down from protecting and promoting access to safe abortion in Canada and around the world. Interim Conservative leader Candace Bergen first asked her caucus not to comment on the draft ruling, later saying in a statement that the Liberals were the only ones reopening the abortion debate. But not everyone in her party agrees. I would gen generally say the debate's never been closed. So where does this leave the political conversation on abortion in this country? What does it mean for the Liberals and the Conservatives? It's Thursday. I'm here with At Issue. Chantelle Bear, Andrew Coyne and Althea Raj. El Amin is away this week. Althea, I'm going to start with you uh, in terms of what you made of the initial political response or I guess uh, delayed response in the case of the Conservatives. Um, I would say entirely predictable. Uh, this is an issue where we know what um, the challenges are uh, within the Conservative Party and we know that the Liberals are as um, eager as they always have been to exploit this issue. If you'll uh, recall the uh, abortion attestation uh, from the uh, Canada Student Jobs Funding from a few years ago. Um, I, that's not to take away from, I think, that the, there are many women across this country who fear that what is happening in the U.S., something similar could happen in this country in the sense that the issues are, are not the same. There is no right to an abortion, despite what the Liberals and the Prime Minister uh, say all the time. There is a, a vacuum, and within that vacuum, uh, it has meant that abortion is not criminalized. But uh, I think it's understandable for the Liberals to suggest that they, or at least as the Prime Minister said Wednesday, um, that they're exploring issues where they could uh, ensure that abortion services are not just protected under this government, but under future governments as well. Um, that being said, a lot of activists are concerned that if you um, legislate the right to abortion, that it would make it easier for, frankly, conservative MPs, because they're the only ones uh, suggesting this, to make it easier for them to restrict abortion. Andrew. Uh as Althea said, it's not only predictable, we've seen this movie over and over again. Uh, it's true that the Liberals, in some senses, like to bring the issue up, up over and over again so as to make the Conservatives uncomfortable. But the fact that the Conservatives are uncomfortable kind of settles the issue for me. Uh, it, it, you know, what party is this that's going to propose legislation to restrict abortion? Uh, the reason the, the Conservatives are so uncomfortable is they can read the polls the same as anybody else, and it would be politically suicidal for them to do so. Uh, the Liberals, it, it is a double-edged sword for them at the same time, because mm -hmm. as Mr. Jagmeet Singh was uh, pointing out, they've been in power for seven years now. There are still the same issues surrounding access to abortion that there were when they came into power. Uh, Mr. Trudeau has been talking about, let's we, we, maybe we'll bring in legislation that will make it impossible for any future government to restrict abortion. I'm not sure what he means, short of a constitutional amendment. But if, you, if, if there were any possibility of the Liberals uh, finally and, 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 and fully settling this issue, I don't think they'd take it because it would take away from them the, issue, the ability to bring it up again and again to, to, to beat the Tories over the head with. So everyone's playing to the same uh, political incentives that they always have. Chantal. Yes, uh, an absent fact in uh, most instances. Uh, like Andrew, I don't believe that Justin Trudeau knows what he means by legislation. Should we have a law that says we have no law? Uh, on, on access to abortion, an interesting proposition, uh, if I ever heard one. As for the conservatives, the three main contenders for the conservative leadership, uh, and not just them, have said publicly, including Pierre Poilievre, that they are pro-choice. And yes, a third of the conservative caucus hails from the other side of that discussion. But uh, I've, the, the Conservatives were in power for 10 years under Stephen Harper, yeah. and nothing happened. So at some point, uh, to continue to say something is happening in the United States, so the boogeyman is coming for you, uh, kinds of get, gets tired. And I think the notion of federal legislation that uh, Justin Trudeau alluded to is a way to try to bring it forward, but seriously. Yeah. Uh, the people who provide abortion services in this country, the governments, are provincial governments. So if the federal government of the day wants to tell provinces sure. that they should do this, 
for abortion, this for uh, health care, then they need a constitutional amendment, not on abortion. But to say that the federal government wants to reclaim competence over health care. Sure. I, I take your point around at some point you, you can't uh, wait for the boogeyman. But I, I think there would be women in the United States that might think as well, well, maybe this is settled. And, and then we let our guard down, uh, as did Democrats. And now we're facing this issue again. Chantal, and then I'll go through everybody again. Yes, but our system is different. Or in case people are not keeping score, for instance, the majority on the Supreme Court of Canada is a Stephen Harper majority. That will be the case until next September. Uh, criminal code provisions, those that regulate abortion in this country, are a federal competence, not a provincial one. It's, it's, it's okay to be worried, but it's good to be aware of basic political facts. Yes. Althea. Okay, I want to come back to something that Chantal said. She said that nothing happened under Stephen Harper, and she's right that no, like, no law has changed. But that did not mean that some conservative MPs did not try to push forward the issue, which they continue to do after he left. And I, I think that that is significant to mention. Whether it was Stephen Woodward's motion on when life begins, or uh, the latest uh, effort to ban sex-selective abortions, um, the pro-life movement in this country, their goal is to elect as many conservative MPs who are anti-abortion as they can. And if you have a leader whose only pledge is, I will not introduce a government bill that will restrict abortion, but allows their backbench to introduce legislation and to have a free vote on this issue, there is the real possibility that if you have a majority government with an overwhelming majority of anti-abortion MPs, that you could have changes uh, to the abor to abortion rights in, in this country. Uh, Andrew, and I'll come back to you, uh, Chantal. Yep. Well, we're different societies between Canada and the United States with different political values and different institutional structures, as Chantal alluded to, or I'll flip it around. In the United States, the criminal law is is you know generally more on the state side than the federal side. There's only a short list of federal uh, crimes. Um, so if you even if you can't win a majority for an abortion law federally in the United States, you can impose it at the state level. In Canada, you'd have to get a majority in the in at the federal level, which is much harder to do. Supposing the, the most extreme possible scenario, because remember, not only does it have to pass the House of Commons, it would have to get through the Supreme Court. And it's very hard to see what kind of abortion law could get past the Supreme Court. But supposing there were something, supposing uh, in the most extreme possible scenario, uh, you banned abortion in the third trimester. That's basically the Roe v. Wade rule. L l last word to you, Chantal, then I'll take a break. It has been my experience that the best way to deal with arguments, and this is a serious argument, is to allow people on both sides of the debate to have their say in the House of Commons. That is what Parliament is about. And I read some of the coverage, and I worry uh, that suddenly people who have a different opinion should not be MPs, or that MPs who are anti-abortion, and there are 40 of them are almost uh, in the Conservative caucus, uh, should somehow not exist. And I don't think that serves politics well, or that it serves the pro-abortion position, uh, that it does not get its tires kicked uh, regularly. There's a real momentum. I feel that momentum out there. Anywhere I go, I can feel it, and people are excited. They're pumped up. People are out there and ready to go. Doug Ford kicked off his campaign earlier earlier this week. Ontarians are going to head to the polls on June 2nd. So how is he positioning himself for re-election after four years in power? Where do the opposition party stand? Chantal, Andrew, and Althea back for one other round of at issue. Andrew, uh, it seems Doug Ford is, is leading in the polls. Um, what do you make of how he's framing himself and, and his pitch to people in Ontario? In 2018, the Conservatives, I think you could say, won in spite of Doug Ford rather than because of him. Uh, arguably, they would have had an even bigger majority with Christine Elliott. I think you could say this time, they, if they do win, it will be in large part because of him. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, he has, uh, by many accounts, has grown in the job. I don't want to overstate that. Uh, we're setting the bar pretty low. But he is much more identifiably a mainstream politician than he was when he started. Uh, I think there's some lessons in that for the federal conservatives, mm. uh, that if he does win, as the polls would indicate at this point, um, he will have done what the federal conservatives have been unable to do, election after election, 
Uh, and that is to say that to tap into the mainstream voter by behaving more like a recognizable adult. Uh, so th that, I think, is the biggest significance, at least for the federal scene in this. Um, Althea, what, what do you make of how Ford's positioning himself? And I guess we should also say his opponents, who I think are having still a hard time uh, fighting back against Doug Ford and his brand. And maybe differentiating themselves from each other. Yeah. I mean, I think part of what we're going to be watching for in this contest is who becomes the voice for progressive voters, whether uh, former Brits rally to the new liberal leader, who's really rather unknown to most Ontarians, Stephen Dilduka, or if, um, you know, Andrew Horvath becomes the uh, the, the voice of uh, center-left voters. I think it's really interesting to look back at how far <laughs> Doug Ford has gone. Like, before the pandemic, he was tanking in the polls. Uh, it was mm -hmm. it was really incredible, frankly, the the pivot that he has been able to do and the the fact that he's basically now running not as a hard right populist conservative leader, but as a centrist candidate. And and the the pandemic management seems to have sort of worn worn away, Chantal. It doesn't seem to be dragging Doug Ford, at least at this stage. Or at least uh, maybe it has saved them. If you look at this popularity, it was down in the basement before the pandemic and rose uh, consistently over the course of that. I've covered a lot of Ontario elections and too many <laughs> to say on the first week that I know how it's going to end on yeah, the, sure. the last week and with lessons the federal conservatives should take. Uh, be I was there for the Bob Ray election. For those who don't remember, David Peterson, the incumbent, started off at 55 percent. And the result was a majority NDP government. So Ontario mm -hmm. does things. Uh, but I think from a federal standpoint, what's most interesting is to how the Trudeau Liberals would probably be happier with Doug mm -hmm. Ford's re-election than they will or would be with François Legault's re-election in Quebec in the fall. Mm -hmm. And that, that kind of coalition, or I think some people called it a bromance this week, Andrew, raised, I guess, a little bit of eyebrows. But as Chantal points out, you, you can see the political advantage for both of them in that. Yes, you you look bipartisan. Uh, you you never look bad as a politician when you're when you're handing out money, uh, and it may be an indication that the, the liberals uh, uh, have handicapped this race, that they think Ford's going to win, so they might as well um, get in good with the guy who's going to win. Althea, I think they just genuinely have a good working relationship. They are. Um, Sympatical on the same priorities, namely bringing um, electric vehicle production to Ontario. <laughs> They've spent billions of dollars now. Yeah. Like there's so many announcements uh, with Justin Trudeau and Doug Ford, and it's, the cabinet ministers have good relationships. I mean, I think um, you know another example is the fact that the Liberals were willing to ink a deal on childcare just before yes. um, the election, despite the fact a lot of Ontario Liberals would have wished that they would have waited until after the contest was over. The federal government decided to do, I think, frankly, what is right um, and, and negotiate this as, as soon as they were able to, rather than hold off for partisan reasons. But I do think it speaks to them choosing to, um, to govern rather than to play politics. Okay. Thank you all for uh, two good conversations. Appreciate it.